So was the president right about what he said about not negotiating with terrorists and radicals? Frank, let's see what the audience thinks. First thing, so the viewers at home get an idea of who you are. How many of you voted for Bush in 2004? Raise your hands. About nine of you. How many of you voted for John Kerry? A fair bit more. How many of you would vote for Bush again if he were up for election this time? Only one individual. Interesting. So let me ask you, I want you to react to Bush's connected speech. Everyone, turn your dials to 50. The more that you agree with it, the higher you'll go. And let's see whether you agree with the president's position on Iran. Let's show the tape. Some seem to believe that we should negotiate with the terrorists and radicals as if some ingenious argument will persuade them they have been wrong all along. We've heard this foolish delusion before. As Nazi tanks, tanks crossed into Poland in 1939, an American senator declared, Lord, if I could only have talked to Hitler, all this might have been avoided. We have an obligation to call this what it is, the false comfort of appeasement, which has been repeatedly discredited by history. That didn't work, did it? Why not? What did you dis tell me? What did you specifically disagree with? No one likes people comparing people to Nazis, and I think it's a very easy, but very, very cheap way to talk about an argument. So you don't think that what Hitler was saying in 1939 is similar to what the Iranian leader is saying today? I think that there are terrorist groups that are as bad, but I think it's just too easy to pull that card, and it doesn't change the argument. There were no specifics. You know, like, um... About who he was talking about. It left it vague, is right. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think he could be talking about numerous groups and people, including former President Carter, um, other nations that have been more willing to sit down than to stand up and do something about, say, nuclear Iran. But um, history repeats itself. It's cyclical. We know it. It looks like we're close to repeating something again. But you're a representative of the American people, and you did not respond well to this. I want to show you now, if you could I all did. turn your dials to 50, please. We're going to show you Barack Obama's response to what President Bush had to say. Let's react to this, please. I believe we need to use all elements of American power to pressure Iran, including tough, principled, and direct diplomacy. That's what John F. Kennedy did. That's what Ronald Reagan did when dealing with the Soviets. And that's what the president's own Secretary of Defense wants to do. I mean, I understand George Bush's Secretary of Defense suggests that we talk directly to Iran. So I don't know if George Bush is calling his own Secretary of Defense an appeaser. I don't know who he's talking about. It's time to present Iran with a clear choice. If it abandons its nuclear program, support for terror, and threats to Israel, then Iran can rejoin the community of nations. If not, Iran will face deeper isolation and steeper sanctions. But in the Bush-McCain worldview, everyone who disagrees with their failed Iran policy is a appeaser. Look at the difference. When Bush was speaking, it was between the 50s and 60s. With Barack Obama, even among Republicans, he's doing better at 65. What was so much better about Obama's response? Well, I, I didn't think it was better. I actually thought that the issue was not one of a negotiation, but one of preconditions before negotiation. I don't think that was addressed, and I, I agreed with Obama, but it's not, it's not about that. It's about negotiating with pre, without preconditions. So you're dialing on the reaction, not necessarily the positive or the negative. Correct. Okay. Well, he left out another president, Teddy Roosevelt, speak softly and carry a big stick. The U.S. has a big stick, whereas Iran is trying to develop a single weapon. They don't have the resources, and with, particularly when he was comparing to Nazi Germany, which had a, an army. Or, Iran does not. Bruce? I think a distinction has to be made between real terrorist groups and real governments. We're fighting terrorist groups. They're not governments. We can't negotiate with governments. There's no diplomacy. So when you're dealing with governments, there's... Are you afraid? Of, how many of you are afraid of Iran? Raise your hands if you're afraid of Iran. Okay, so a little bit more than half of you, but what, what are you afraid of? I think that they would get the nuclear weapon and, and try to hurt us and hurt Israel. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid that unlike some countries where you, you get an argument over policy, you're dealing with a religious group. When you come to religion, that you, there's no right or wrong because they're not going to change their views. 
But I disagree with the first part of what Obama said. What John F. Kennedy did, what Reagan did, they weren't dealing with, with uh, people that were actually killing Americans. Iran is indirectly killing Americans by providing the insurgents with uh, weapons and training. Do you all agree with this? Do you agree or disagree? Yes. 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 Last comment. You're, you're one of the youngest people here. You're going to have to live with this. Yes. Well, I'm mainly afraid of the actual conflict that's going to result if uh, such American sentiment continues, because it's going to be something like Iraq repeated. I'm going to ask you an ugly question. How many of you are more afraid of President Bush than you are the Iranian leader? One, two, three, four, five, about eight of you. Interesting. Stay with us. The Strategy Room rolls on after this.